we got to really cogitate this for a second. Because, all right, let's think about Greek. I mean, we can go back to Greek because Greek is, you know, I've, I've tried to get your minds around this Greek thing. In Greek culture, does a man ever say to his wife, I phileo you? No, very doubtful, okay? Uh, you know what? He would probably, he might say he eros her, maybe. That means romantic love in Greek, but maybe not. I mean, why would you have an eros for your wife? You say that for the slaves and the, the harlots. I mean, that's the way the Greek culture is, right? You know, you show your field, shield buddy that you uh, phileo him. You definitely don't tell your gods that you love them. You're happy, you know, it's like, I'm eating meat, I'm happy to see it. Siren hour, right? Um, because that's what the sacrifice about, it's epithumia, right? So, you know, in the Greek even, storge, storge, which means very comfortable love. I mean, that's probably, uh, you know, maybe a man would tell his wife, I storge you. I have comfortable feelings around you. That, that's special, right? <laughs> now, now, back that up. Back that up a thousand years. A culture that has only two words, that are, has no word for love. No word for love. The closest I get is a hop for human affection. Who's who's a guy saying a hop to? Another human. Well, no, I mean, who is he saying a hop to? To God. One of the other guys. Well, yeah, one of the, his. You know, Hebrew is not necessarily a shield culture, but Hebrew is a. Um, you know, what kind of culture did I tell you that that ancient yeah. Hebrew is? It's a pillage culture. It's a pillage culture. And so, in a pillage culture, who's your buddy? The people who aren't pillaging you, right? <laughs> so you may be saying, a hob to, you know, your, the guy who's your warrior friend. You may be saying a hob to the prostitute on the street so you can, you know, get her to, you know, hey, babe, right? But you're not saying it to your wife. You're not saying it to your immediate family. You're not saying it to your children. This isn't something you say to your children. But yet, the writer starts out, I, uh -huh. I have a human affection for Yahweh. And by the way, <coughs> what word did he use? Yahweh. Yahweh. The, the word that shall not be said. Right? So much so that Josephus tells us that the high priest whispered it. They didn't even know how to say it in the time of Christ. <coughs> they weren't sure how the word was pronounced. They knew it when they heard it. But they didn't say it. No one said it except the high priest. Uh, this is pretty deep stuff. It goes on, it says, For he, he shama, he listened to. He listened to my call. And it's not voice, it's calls, the sounds I made. You know, remember the bitter groanings of Paul? The sounds, oh, you know, the groans. He heard my cry, that's added, for tachwan, my earnest prayer, literally my bending and stooping. So this starts out, this psalm starts out, and, rem and remember, what is the first and second verse usually for a psalm? Remember the construction of Hebrew literature? It's your summary, it's your synopsis. So your synopsis of this whole psalm is, I have human affection for Jehovah because he listened to my cries, my earnest prayer, literally my bending and stooping. So, you know, already we have a psalm that begins with something that's very late, a very late understanding, a very late kind of concept, something that is not a normal concept, okay? How can I say this to you? How shocking do you think this is? This is a very shocking statement. Okay, so now do you get why they don't say this at certain times and festivals? It's probably today it's cultural. But in the past, it was what? This is a very personal psalm. This is incredibly personal. This is the kind of psalm that when you say it, you cover the ears of your children. Let's just contrast this. For example, Muslim faith. I know Ann did a class on the Muslim faith. How did the Muslims view God, generally? Would you say, I love you? No, no. Do you see this? And he would not say it to you either. I 
he wouldn't say it to you. Why? Okay. Uh, you know, matter of fact, what's really constructed to us is if you look at Islamic, you know, the Islamic forms, Islamic form is very, very strongly ancient, ancient Hebraic, in especially cultural. So it's very neat to see this because even the medieval, what's the medieval view of, for example, God? Why do they need Mother Mary back in the medieval period? But why? What did they view God as in the medieval period? A judge. A judge and removed. And what did they view Christ as? The offspring of that judge that was removed. And so one of the reasons that Mary, a lot of Mary things came up was because within the context, Mary was nurturing. And so the church needed a nurturer, and they viewed it as a nurturer. They didn't have the view that we have today of Christ as brother, as a nurturer. Because Christ wasn't your brother, right? See? Although that's what we understand it as today. That's not the view of ancient peoples. And so what we need to do, like I said, with all these cultural things, we've got to take our blinders off. We've got to look at it culturally and see how people think about it. Why would they have come up with that interpretation of Christ? I mean, he washed the disciples' feet. Because, and this is really important to us. <clears throat> if you remember back to why, what was the most important thing that St. Francis of Assisi gave to us? Does anybody know? The, the, not the passion plays, but you know the things we do. Steps or no, the what do we do? You know, you know we do those uh, the crutch. You know the crutch. Saint Francis of Assisi invented the crutch. Why did he invent the crutch? Because the priests were illiterate and couldn't read, and if they could read, what could they read? Latin. And the people could they speak Latin? Did they understand Latin? Did they understand it? The Douay, the Bible, was all in Latin. So even if they read it, the people couldn't understand it. So St. Francis of Assisi wanted to bring the message of Christ to the people. How did he do it? Visual With visual images to the crutch. And so the crutches are invent were invented by uh, St. Francis of Assisi to give the birth message about Christ to the people. Which began, by the way, the idea of Christ as the loving Savior idea. That came from St. Francis of Assisi. But before that, could the, pe the people couldn't understand what was being said to them, read to them. They had no idea. And many of the priests were illiterate. They couldn't read it either. So what was the view? A vengeful Christ. Because they didn't know any better. They, they didn't know. You know. Remember, we have our Bibles... But they, you know, Bibles, we didn't have them until 1800s, 1830s, right? We talked about that before. So, yeah, this is, this is important stuff. This is how you look at the world from the past, because it's much different than the world that we have today. And, you know, um, hey, that's why we're taking off our blinders, you know? We all, we are all like this, right? We expect, you know, I, I actually use the washing machine. It's pretty easy once I figured out, push the right buttons, you know, but... The, the point is, that, you know, we're used to washing machines. And none of us are used to going out pounding rocks, pounding, uh, you know, pounding your under, undies on a rock. <laughs> right? I mean, what a terrible thing to have to do. And wringing it out. Right? So, anyway. And that's not that far away, right? They invented washing machines, what, in the 30s, 40s? So, I yeah, come a long way, baby. In any case. Um, let's go on. Let's see what, what verse 2 says, because we expect verse 2 to be a what? A parallel statement of some type. It says, because he bent, he turned, he bent. I like bent better. He bent his ear, his cup of the ear. Literally, you know, Hebrew is so euphemistic that they don't have a word for ear. They don't have a word for an eye. The word is the cup, shaped like a cup. And so the connotation of this is both that he cupped his hand around his ear, and the ear is a cup to pick up sounds. So literally it says, he bent the cup of his ear to me. I will quara, I will address him by name. 
as long as I live. And, okay, the problem with this is it's not as long as I live, it's yom. What's yom? A fixed period of time. In other words, how long? Through my life. Not for eternity. This is very important. Because our assumption is, now it does say as long as I live. So, you know, we should have the assumption of until death, right? But what is our assumption always clouded by? Well, culturally, we believe, you know, our belief is that people live on after death, right? Their souls live on after death. This is an important thing. Remember, what was ancient Hebrews view? Well, originally you're dead, you're dead, but yeah, you go to Sheol, and we'll see that. We'll, we'll see. Remember, these are indicators we look for in the Psalms. But what's really interesting is, you know, this is translated as long as I live, but the word actually used is yom, so it's a fixed period. So as opposed to the other choice of the word that it could use, right, which is means eternity. So this points to what, what culturally about this psalm right away? It's got to be early. It's got to be an earlier psalm. Now, we don't know exactly when, but, you know, we got some strange language here. Because look what it says. Okay, um, I'm going to jump. Uh, okay, in English culture, you guys don't have any an antecedents for this very much. Very much. You go back to Victorian literature, there is a thing. Calling people by the first name in Victorian culture. You never did that. It's Mr. Darcy. Even after you married him, it's Mr. Darcy, right? You had to be incredibly familiar. As a matter of fact, many times wives did not address their husbands by their first names in Victorian culture. Just read the Bronte sisters if you don't believe me. They call them by their given by their last names. You know, Mr. Darcy, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett, when would you like to do dinner? Right? Mm -hmm. See? I guess we do have some antecedents. In Japanese culture, it is very impolite to call anyone by their first name. And by the way, it's their last name because they have last and first. It's backwards. <laughs> they always say, you know, as a matter of fact, even to school friends, you would use, you know, if you were on a more familiar ground, you might use their first name with San. San means like Mr. Wow. It's, it is considered incredibly intimate for you to share first names with people in Japanese culture, in Asian culture, in that culture. We don't, we, we call it, you know, matter of fact, people, telemarkers call you by your first name. Like, don't talk to me about my first name. You know, I, I mean, let's get some decorum back in the world here. But what does this writer say? Listen to what he says. <clears throat> I will quara, address him by name. This is a culture, okay, if you're not saying you love your wife, if you're not saying that you have affection for your wife or your children, do you think you're calling them by their names? I don't even know what they would call them by. Hey, wife. Right? I don't know. I'm just pointing out to you that what does this say? It says, I will address him, that is God, by name. So this author already said that he has affection, human affection for God, and now he says he's going to address him by name. And by the way, remember what we said about saying Jehovah, Yahweh? In Hebrew culture at the time of Josephus, you weren't supposed to. Remember, the Talmud says that what's the interpretation of don't say the Lord's name in vain? You, never, you don't ever say it unless you're allowed to by, you know, you're the high priest. You're the high priest, you can say it every now and then. You know, only one time a year, right? Out loud. At Josephus' time, that's what they were doing. Christ's time, that's what they were doing. So, already, you know, this is an intimate poem. Already, a very intimate poem to God. Let's go on. Let's see what else it says. Ooh. All right. This really gets interesting. The chords. Now, literally, it is Shabelle. It's the bindings. Now, this word is very interesting because the word is bindings, but it comes from the twisted, a twisted measuring line, a line used to measure an inheritance, to measure a field. What else do you bind? Contracts. Mm -hmm. Animals. 
Uh, within the context of the temple, what do you buy? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. Matter of fact, the word shebel is the word used to bind, meaning binding the sacrifice. So let's see what this says. The shebel, the bindings of death, of Mabat. And literally this means death in the place of the dead. Because, okay, remember, Hebrew is euphemistic. So the place of the dead is what? Sheol. But Mabat means the dead and their place. So Sheol is what? A place. Mabeth is what? The dead and Sheol in their place. The bindings, this, okay, first of all, what is his measured inheritance? Death and the place of the dead. And you notice it's really cool because the word that's used, he didn't say Sheol. If it said Sheol, then his inheritance is what? The place. But he says Mavef, which means his inheritance is the place and to be a member of that place of death. Uh, we're already seeing, I mean, if you just get this already, we're already this is early. It's got to be early. Uh, at least culturally it's early. We'll see. Entangled, and the word is afafat, meaning surrounded me. Entangled, uh, surrounded afafat me. And, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of uh, there are there are a whole bunch of Hebrew words for to be surrounded. That is in itself is interesting. There's probably like five to eight words uh, that are means to be surrounded, and we'll see them. There's examples of them throughout these Hillel, the Hillel. Well, what does that tell you? Not very good words. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well. You know, um, what, what's the word we use when someone is uh, always uh, worried that uh, that someone's looking at them or, or uh, paranoia. paranoia? There's a paranoia going on here, right? <laughs> but the thing that's funny about surrounding is, for example, God can surround you and protect you. And hedges and thorns can surround you and protect you. Those are other words in Hebrew. But in this case, the surrounding is, in this translate, is entangled. It literally means to be surrounded. And by the way, what is what is surrounding? What is surrounding within this context? Yeah. Death, which is the shisha, the bindings, the bindings of death. Um, surrounded me in the metzah, the anguish. And literally, uh, we're going to see this word. It's in the 118th Psalm. I should give it to you as a word of the day. But metzah means the cavity and the guts. From Hebrew, it means the cavity which is scooped out. The cavity which is scooped out. Does that not be a prayer? Well, you're thinking along the right lines. What is? What do you think? What is the? Why would they say the guts are the cavity that is scooped out? Where does that come from? Making a mummy. Making a mummy. Making a mummy. Do you remember where did they come out of? Egypt. Egypt. They took with them the Egyptian mummification ideas. In Egypt, they would scoop out the guts. Now, Hebrew didn't scoop, scoop out the guts. We saw, you know, what they did is they mummified you, but they left the guts in, which is kind of gross anyway. They're taking them out, leaving them in, either way, you're, you know, it's not happy. But the point is this, that the word that's used for anguish or tightness, remember there's a Greek word for this, which means to be encompassed by crowds that Paul uses all the time. I can't remember what it is right hand, but it means to be press under pressure, which is stress in Greek, to be crowded. Well, in Hebrew, it's the tightness of the gut. It's a feeling in the gut. But the word comes for how the gut scooped out. So in other words, you feel like your gut's being scooped out. We know what that is like, right? Right? right. right? So you're feeling bad about it. Well, no, you just, everyone knows, you know, I mean, Paul writes about, you know, the feeling in your bowels, right? You, you, you get that, you know, the sinking in our gut, the sinking, right? The sinking feeling in English, you know? We know what this. We know exactly what he's talking about. But it, what's really interesting is he's using what kind of language here? What's the metaphorical language? It's about funeral rites. It's about the grave. It's about death. I mean, he immediately moves from the affection for God and the fact that God is listening to him to what? Fear of death. To death. To, well, 
I don't know if it's fear of death, but, about it. but there's an anxiety here, right? There's some, yeah, there's exactly. Some that it controls it. Well, yeah, well, let's see what it, yeah, let's see what goes on. The mensa, the anguish of the Sheol. Yeah, I know that our, you know, they translate it grave. It's Sheol, right here. It's Sheol. Came upon me, matzah, came forth to me. I was overcome by tassara, by tightness, by cramps. And you notice, I got metzar, which means tightness, and tassara, they're, they're words that are, uh, uh, they're similar words, meaning tightness, cramps in the gut. And sorrow, yagon, meaning affliction or grief. So what I got here is I got in one, one sentence, one verse, I got mavev, which means both the dead and sheol, and I got the word sheol. So the author is trying to make a very specific point. He's, he's making this separation or distinction, but at the same time he says that you know, the, the writer is encompassed, bound by the inheritance of death. That includes both Sheol and death. So, ah, this psalm is probably going to be about death. And if you notice, okay, why would you exclude this psalm from festivals? And not very cheery, right? <laughs> it's not very cheery. Four, then I call Quara. Then I call Quark. So in three, he said he was going to call out Quark, the name of God, right? I'll call out your name. And then it says in four, I call, I Quara on the Shem, the appellation, the name, you know, we translate name, of Yahweh. O Yahweh, Malat. Now this is very interesting. Because Malat means literally to be born. To escape like a child from the birth canal. That's where the word comes from in Hebrew. So malat. Now malat is very different from what's the other word? We're going to see this other word in the 118th Psalm. And I don't think it's in the 116th Psalm. Um, but we see it in the 118th Psalm. What's, what is the word for salvation or deliverance in Hebrew? This is great. What is the answer in everything in, in Lutheranism? Jesus. <laughs> Yeshua, Jesus. Yeshua is the word used for salvation or deliverance in Hebrew. So again, Jesus is the answer to everything in Lutheran thought. This is pretty cool. So he didn't use the word. He did not use the word. Yeshua. He used the word malat, which means birth. To make smooth birth. And then it says says, Malat Nefesh. Remember? Do you remember what the word Nefesh is? Nefesh is the breath that God put in Adam, as opposed to Ruach. Ruach is the spirit. Nefesh is the breath of life in Adam. So already, early or late? Early. Because he's using Nefesh specifically. Um, now, this is very interesting, though. He's basically saying, physically, let me escape from death. But the connotation is, how is he being escaped from death? Through birth. Rebirth. Wow. Okay. Which is a very Egyptian concept, isn't it? Um, uh, isn't that our concept of baptism? <laughs> This yes, is, this is before. This is it's not really Egyptian, it but it, you know, um, you know, it, it's I don't disagree with that. I like that. You know, I'm not I'm not saying read too much. Well, yeah, read as much as you want into this. Okay, this is really interesting, but to put a context of uh, salvation from death by rebirth or birth. Now we're going to get the point because if, if anyone you know, can you figure it out on your own? I mean. No. Is this one of the first times rebirth has been mentioned in this context? Well, it's not really rebirth per se. It's just it saved me from death through birth. Is that what Christ was referring to in Nicodemus? Could be. Okay. Could be. But but let me the okay. I'm gonna we're gonna run out of time. 
So let me give you the context so you can think about it because we'll, we'll start back here next week. But let's look at the context. All right, if you do not have a concept of eternal life, if you do not have a concept like we do with Christianity of the rebirth through baptism, what about birth makes you continue to live? Your first birth. What, what? Your first birth. Your, your children. Your children. And by the way, think about this. This is a context we're going to find within this song. That how do you exp how do you find eternity through God continuing your lineage. through continuing your lineage, and that's you know, um, but at the same time, you know, and that's why I say don't read too much into it within a, a Hebrew cultural context, but if you want to read into it, go ahead and read into it because what does this lay out? What is this set up? It's a messianic, yeah. It's hugely messianic. Okay, so we already got three reasons why you might not use this during festivals. The first, it's very personal with God and unusual in that regard. Number two, it's what? It's dour about death. And number three, it has what context? A messianic context. And by the way, 118 song has a very strong messianic context. We're going to see that. We'll get to that. You know, it's really fun looking at these psalms. I love looking at these psalms this way because the depth in them is, to me, is impressive. Yeah? But back then, it was long before Jesus, and they were waiting for the Messiah. So why would they necessarily run away from the messianic message? They were Early psalms are not necessarily looking for Messiah. Remember, that's have to be after Ruth. But, you know, that's something to think about. I mean, this almost goes all the way back to the conversation Abraham and God. I'm, I'm just saying, put it within the context. Remember, they don't have this any, any real messianic context early song, but we're seeing it all over the place, right? Anyway, thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen.